Well, I would like to introduce you, um, for many of you, it won't be a um, new introduction, but I would like to say a few words about our guest today. Dr. Mark Williams is the current, currently serves as the lead pastor of the North Cleveland Church of God in Cleveland, Tennessee. Dr. Williams previously served as general overseer for the Church of God, the highest leadership role in the denomination from 2012 to 2016. Dr. Williams also previously served as the, as the second general assist, I, I'm sorry, second assistant general overseer from 2008 to 2012. Prior to leading the Church of God on the International um, Executive Committee, listen to this. Dr. Mark Williams was the state overseer of California. Yeah! And was a member and I was a member of the International Executive Council. Out of your whole bio, that's the thing that matters most to us. We know that you led the free world, but you also led us and that his wife, the amazing Pastor Reverend Sandra K. Williams. She joyfully leads the prayer ministry of North Cleveland Church of God, having previously served as the international director of the Church of God Women's Ministry. She is a mentor and a friend to countless credentialed women and wives of pastors. Sandra K. Williams especially loves pouring into the next generation and desires for girls to see godly female leadership as the norm in the church rather than an exception. Pastor Sandra K. serves on numerous boards and committees, but especially enjoys reading, walking outdoors, and pulling weeds. But I've been to her house. There's no weeds. They come with high credentials, high degrees, all of that. But on a personal level, there is no couple in the entire world that has been more influential on my life. I have never met a more humble couple in all my, all my life. And even though they lead the amazing mother church, the North Cleveland Church of God, they're in Cleveland, Tennessee. They are still so humble in serving anybody that they come across. Their hearts precede them everywhere they go. And so I want you to stand to your feet and I want you to give a living waters welcome to the best couple I know, doctors and pastors, Mark and Sandy K. Williams. Will you welcome them? Yes, yes. I'm gonna grab your microphone. Will you? I, thank you so much. He's gonna have the mic here and he's gonna talk a lot. And so I would like for you to speak um, to Living Waters. You may be seated. Thank you so much for your warm welcome. Um, I would like you to um, greet the um, congregation. But as a forerunner in uh, credentialed women within our denomination, um, she is making a path uh, for many of us. And it's not easy what she does and the influence that she has. And we are so very, very grateful. I'm personally really, really grateful. <laughs> For all that you do, and I love you. I love calling you friend. Sandra Kay. Talk about influential. Your pastor is a rock star, okay? Yes, she is. I, I sent a picture from the uh, Pentecostal uh, prayer tower, uh, at the Azusa Street prayer tower. She um, is a global leader now. Because I, I wish y'all would have put that picture I sent up on the screen because she did this fantastic welcome yesterday. So anointed, articulate, poised, beautiful. She just the whole package, you know. And so there's no jealousy there between us. But um, I love, I love, love, love Pastor Dina Query. 
there is a scripture that is often quoted on Mother's Day. It says, there is no, jo- no greater joy than to know my children are walking in truth. And there's a mother in this room today who is probably the happiest woman in the world, and that is Sister Finneby Moore, because her children and her children's children, and now her children's children's children are walking in truth. My hat's off to the matriarch of this house, and I'm so grateful, so grateful. Yes. And I love this church because the title is Living Waters. This name doesn't mean still water. It means living water. You honor the past. You honor the papa and the matriarch of the church. But you are looking to the future with faith. And these young people up here on this stage this morning are proof that this is a living water. This is a house that is moving forward. It is not stagnant. It is not stale. But it is living. And I'm so, so grateful for that. The scripture also says that in the last days I will pour out out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. And as Pentecostals, we know that the spirit empowers women. And anyone who tries to disempower women is not working against women. They are working against the spirit of God who has anointed women to preach the gospel. I believe the reason that this house is blessed is because of your endorsement, your support, your love, and your prayers for your pastor who just happens to be a woman, and a mighty woman of God at that. Okay, it was a little dangerous to give the microphone <laughs> to me, so I am going to pass it to, to one greater than I. Um, <laughs> For sure. We, we love y'all so much. And, and when I saw Michael walk in this morning, I just, uh, tears to my eyes. When we came here, it's been almost 20 years ago. I know, I just don't seem that old, do I? But um, yeah, 20, uh, it was 2004, 2004. And so they had this adorable little redhead. And we happened to have an adorable little redhead as well. And they just became tight friends, Michael and Austin. And so to uh, be able to love on Pastor Daniel, Pastor Aubrey, and, of course, Michael is is one of the great joys uh, for me today. But God is good He is faithful. He has seen you through storms. And those storms did not uh, shake the house to the point or or tear it apart, but just made you stronger. And the, the days ahead are greater than your past. I believe it with all of my heart. God bless you. I love you so much. Amen. Oh, my goodness. I can't think of a thing to say now. Man, that was awesome. Honestly, I don't know how to say it better. Uh, We are totally, totally blessed and honored to be here today. This church, the people that make up this church, the leadership, they mean the world to Sandra Kay and me. A big shout out to those that are watching online because I am a part of the online community. (laughs) And uh, most Sundays, on Sunday afternoons, thanks to the time difference, I'm able to join Living Waters and able to watch and to listen to the ministry of uh, this church. And I'm so, so very blessed to be with the pastor, Dina Quarry. As Sandra Kaya said, is a high honor. We love you, we treasure you, we believe in you. We could not be more grateful for you. And of course, uh, Aubrey and Michael and Daniel, love them. I couldn't love them more if they were our own. And then to be with Dan and Finneby Moore, uh, I, I cherish you both. And I thank the Lord for you. Uh, it, it's just really a highlight for us to be able to, to be here. And the worship today blessed me so very deeply. 
and the students that have been here and all of you, thank you for your welcome and for the privilege to share God's word today. So Father, today as we prepare our hearts to hear what the Spirit would say to us, I pray that we would have open and receptive hearts. I pray that our hearts today would be made into fertile soil so that the seed of the word can go deeply and be implanted, be rooted, and bring forth an abundant harvest. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, that Jesus may be glorified that needs may be met today. In Jesus' name, amen. If you don't mind, let's just stand for the reading of God's word. I'm reading today from the gospel according to Luke. In Luke chapter 7. Gospel according to Luke chapter 7. I'm going to be reading from the New International Version. Whatever version that you happen to have with you, feel free to follow along. Beginning with verse 11 of Luke chapter 7. Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain. And his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And the large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her. And he said, don't cry. Then he went up and touched the buyer they were carrying him on, and the bearers stood still. He said, young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were all filled with awe and they praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. Today, my message is just simply that God has come to help his people. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be unto God. You may be seated. treasured and held tightly in the hearts of so many that lived in the days of Jesus is that God would someday come to help his people. This was the very promise that had been made through the prophets in Hebrew scriptures. That one day there would come a Messiah who would establish the rule of God on earth. Prophets like Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Micah, Zephaniah, Zechariah, just to name a few, all spoke of the coming of this Messiah who would come and God would again help his people. Among the venerated prophets that spoke, the prophet Isaiah was perhaps the most often quoted in this regard. He wrote, the people who 
walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who dwell in the valley of the shadows, a light is going to dawn. For a child will be born and a son will be given. The government will be upon his shoulders. He will wear the ensign of royalty. He will reign as a righteous king. And of the increase of his kingdom and of his peace, there shall be no end. He even specifically was able to say that he will come from the tribe of Judah. He will come through the lineage of David. And the spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and of might. The spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he will be conscious of this anointing. For it will be this anointing of the Holy Spirit that will enable him to bring comfort to those who mourn, to bring beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And when he comes, the poor will hear the good news, and the broken hearted will be healed. But the years since that prophecy was given passed. The Assyrians came and they occupied Israel and they left. The Babylonians came, they occupied Israel and they left. The Persian government came and they occupied Israel and they left. There was Alexander the Great who came with the Greeks and they ruled and they left. The Hasmonean Empire was able to rise. The Hasmonean Dynasty rather rose and fell and they left. And after all of these years, Israel and much of the known world was now under the occupying power of Rome. Rome with its marching legions. Rome with its imperial city built upon seven hills. Rome the empire so vast until it was said that the sun never sets on the Roman Empire. Taxes were high and the burden of debt was heavy and the people who lived in Israel and especially around Galilee, very little literacy. They had to depend on the land or on the lake of Galilee for their very survival. But news was beginning to spread. News was spreading that there was a prophet, an unorthodox prophet, dressed in camel's hair with a leathern girdle about his loins. He had come up from the hills of Galilee and had gone as far as the wilderness of Judea. He was now in the Jordan River near Bethany, baptizing and saying, Repent! For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. People were coming to his baptism. And among those that came, news has it that there was one who was from Nazareth, the son of a carpenter and his wife. And this man named Jesus of Nazareth, coming out of the waters of baptism, John saw the Spirit descending upon him in the form of a dove. A voice began to shout and begin to say, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And if that's not enough, further news has it, he's even gone to a wedding in Cana and saved a social disaster from happening from a bride and a groom and turned water into wine. They're also seeing on their news feed that he's been in Jerusalem and he overturned tables in Jerusalem and, and purified the temple, even entered into a conversation with a representative of the Sanhedrin, something about being born again. They're also saying that in Sychar, there was a woman who left her water pot on the well of Jacob, claiming he had given her living water. And she was saying, come see a man that has told me everything that I ever did. Is not this the Messiah? In fact, now at Capernaum, the news is that Jesus has even healed a 
son of a centurion, a servant of a centurion, a Roman centurion's servant who was grievously sick, has now been healed. And he didn't even go to lay his hands on him. He just spoke the word. And the word brought healing to that servant. All of this was taking place. But now, in a... Hallelujah. I just feel the Lord dropped a word in my heart saying, and my word will go in power and there will be nothing to be able to hinder. Hallelujah. Can we praise God? Hallelujah. Glory to your name, Lord. Well, while all of this is happening, in the little village called Nain, a tragedy has taken place. Nain was a very small village that was located in southern Galilee in the plains of Jezreel near a very small hill called Little Hermon. That city Nain, the name means pleasant. If you stood in the village of Nain, you could look to the north and there you could see the wooded Mount Tabor. You could look to the south and you could see the town called Shunem. You could look to the east and you could see that town Endor. You remember that story of Saul who went to Endor trying to find a word from the Lord and ended up with spiritus. You could look to the west. You could see the edge of the town of Nazareth. That name, Nain, meaning pleasant, there was nothing pleasant on this day in the town of Nain because a little son that they had watched grow up right among them, a son that had grown up in that little village and they saw him grow up, had been stricken dead. And a tragedy had taken place in the town of Nain. The silence of the town of Nain had been broken by the sound of a little timbrel that was sounding. There was the sound of a flute that was playing. A funeral orator was leading a procession with a buyer and the body of that son on the buyer, followed by a woman whose heart had been broken again and again and again. For this was not the first loss that she had. Her husband, before that, had died. She was a widow. A quick aside, some of us who lived in the West, we often forget about the plight of widows in the days of Jesus. In the days of Jesus, when someone married a husband, you not only married the husband, you married the family. And if your husband Died, you became the property of that family. They were the ones that controlled your security and your destiny. In the case of a Leverite marriage, a brother of the deceased could sometimes come and whether you wanted it or not, would take you as his wife and raise up children to the honor of the brother. And if he or the family didn't want you, if they decided that you were just an economic hardship on the family, then they would release you and you would be on your own and you would be subject to all kinds of oppression, all kinds of exploitation, and a life of poverty. And in the Roman government, widows and women in general had no standing whatsoever. Ever. But at least she had a son. There was still a son that was left. Her son was the hope for her future. She had a son for companionship. She had a son that could carry on the legacy of her husband, his father. But now he's dead. And she is in the procession. 
And she is on her way following another funeral procession. In front of her was the buyer. Now a buyer was an open-faced stretcher made of wicker upon which the dead bodies were placed. The dead body of her son was wrapped in a burial shroud and had simply a napkin over his face. That buyer was being born by some friends of their family, unshod feet, and in front of them was the funeral orator that was announcing the good deeds that were done by this young man. Then the buyer was being borne by the friends and there were sounds of the tinkling of a cymbal and the sound of a, uh, the sound of a flute and the chants, the Hebrew scriptures being chanted as they made their way through the city of Nain out toward the burial ground, this, this, this hewn, this rock-hewn sepulcher into which this body was going to be interred. But 25 miles away, the sounds of the tears of a broken heart captured the heart of Jesus. He dropped what he was doing. He said to everyone and his disciples, I got to go to Nain. Let's go now, to get to Nain, he had to walk 25 miles uphill. To get to Nain, he had to walk around the northern shore of Galilee, walk up Mount Tabor, down Mount Tabor, through the plains, up another mountain, Mount Moray, down Mount Moray, ascending all the time from 600 feet below sea level up to 700 feet above sea level. And he made that journey just in time to meet the funeral procession that was taking place. It just lets me know that there is no distance Jesus is not willing to cover. There is no distance so great for Jesus to make the journey to anyone that has a broken heart. I don't know today what brokenness that you may have had in your life and in your family. I'm not sure the tears that maybe you have shed at night, but there is a Savior who is drawn to your broken heart. He will do whatever He has to do in order to get to you. You are not too far from His reach. You are not hidden today from his view. Whatever he has to do, if he has to take a detour and go to Samaria in order to find you at a well. If he has to walk on a storm-tossed sea to get to you while your ship is about to break apart. If he has to take a cross and climb up a hill just to be able to reach you, he is willing to do it. We sing it all the time, but it really is true. There's no shadow you won't light up. No mountain you won't climb up coming after me. There is no wall you will not kick down. No lie you will not tear down coming after me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming never-ending, reckless love of God. Yeah. Hallelujah. Oh, what links that he goes to show us that there is a God who cares. There's no distance Jesus is not willing to cover. But not only that, secondly, there is no heart so broken that he is not wanting to heal. When Jesus arrives, he interrupts the funeral procession. And he sees 
this one whose heart had been broken time and time again. And the scripture says that when Jesus saw her, I think it's in verse 13. Yeah, here it is. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her. We do not serve a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in all points was tempted, even as we are, yet without sin. In fact, the Bible tells us in Jeremiah chapter 8, for the hurt of my people, I am hurt. Isaiah the prophet in Isaiah chapter 6 says that when they were afflicted, I was afflicted. He came to show us that God is near to those who have a broken heart. He saves those that are of a contrite spirit. A broken and a contrite heart he will never despise. And Psalm 147 verse 4 said that he heals the broken in heart and he binds up their wounds. Sometimes, sometimes we, we don't like people to see us cry. We are embarrassed for our tears. We feel like that our tears somehow imply some sort of weakness. And we want to hide our tears. But I want to tell you there is nothing more attractive to God than the tears that you shed. In fact, tears are nothing to be ashamed of. Tears are the unfair filtered language of the soul when words simply will not come. Tears are vehicles of intercession. I think of uh, Esther who fell before the king and wept uh, profusely before the king, begging the king not or to put an end to the hatred of Haman. David said, I have filled my bed with tears. He went on to say that my tears have been my food day and night. Not only our tears, Jesus knows what it is to also cry with tears. He wept at the tomb of Lazarus. He wept over the city of Jerusalem. He wept in the garden of Gethsemane. Hebrews said that he offered up prayers and intercessions with strong crying and with tears. Tears are a language that God understands. He came to show us that God is not like an idol with eyes that cannot see or ears that cannot hear or a heart that cannot feel. No, God is moved by your tears. He's moved today by your brokenness. He's drawn to your brokenness and he comes to heal your broken heart and remind you that weeping may endure for the night, but joy is going to come in the morning. Hallelujah. The day will come when God will take his beautiful uh, gauze of love and dip it into a fountain flowing with Emmanuel's veins and wipe every tear from our eyes. There's no brokenness that Jesus will not heal. There's no distance that he is unwilling to cover. But thirdly, there is no life so defiled that Jesus is not willing to touch. Verse 14 says, He went up and touched. Don't miss this. He went up and touched the buyer they were carrying him on. And the bearers stood still. In the days of Jesus, in first century Judaism, to touch anything associated with a corpse meant that the person was instantly defiled. They had to isolate themselves for seven days. 
They had to go through ritual ablutions and ceremonial washings and offer sacrifices up in order to be accepted again into the community. And if they didn't do that, they would be excluded from the community. But Jesus didn't let that keep him from touching that buyer. He went up and he touched the buyer. I want to tell you, Jesus has a reputation of touching the untouchable. The, 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 there was one occasion when a man filled with leprosy, highly contagious uh, of disease in his body that was tearing his body apart. And he came toward Jesus and said, if you can do anything, you can make me clean. And, and Jesus reached out and touched him and he was made whole walking through Bethsaida there were two blind men that cried out Jesus son of David have mercy upon me and Jesus stopped and he went out and touched that person on another occasion in the Decapolis there was a man who was both deaf and mute Jesus put his fingers in the man's ears, touched the man's tongue, and said, Epratha, which means be open. And instantly, the man began to hear and the man began to speak plainly. He touched the hand of Peter's mother-in-law when she had a raging fever. Uh, he was willing to rub shoulders with other people that people despise like tax collectors like Zacchaeus and Matthew. He was willing to sit down at a table full of sinners because Jesus says there is no life so defiled that I am not willing to touch. And here today you may feel that you have done so many things. You may feel that even your condition health wise renders you unclean but there is a Savior who is making his way toward you and the one that touched the multitude can reach out and touch you he can make you clean and make you whole <laughs> oh oh what a truth there was no distance too great for Jesus to cover there's no heart so broken that he's not willing to heal there is no life so defiled that Jesus is not willing to touch and lastly there was no relationship so dead that Jesus cannot restore for when Jesus arrived at that funeral procession, touched that buyer, Son, I say to you, get up! <laughs> and the scripture says, the young man, the dead man, sat up and began to talk. Sat up spoke up and Jesus gave him back to his mother. He sat up and he spoke up. I wonder what he said. I'd love to have been there just to hear what he was going to say when he sat up and was raised. He was raised up because there's no relationship so dead that Jesus cannot restore. And he's here today to raise the dead. You know, the day is coming when all that are in the graves will hear the voice of the Son of God. And they that hear shall live. I think of the Song of Solomon. We read there where it says, Arise, my love, and come away. For lo, the winter is past and the rain is ended. And the time of the singing of the birds have come and the voice of the turtle is heard throughout the land. My beloved spake unto me and he said, rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. Oh, the one who spoke to Lazarus and told him to come. The one that spoke to the daughter of Jairus and told him to get up. That voice is going to sound and we will hear his voice for his sheep know his voice when the Lord descends from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and the dead in Christ will rise and all that are alive will rise to meet him in the air. Yeah. Hallelujah. Death will not have the last word. 
And death didn't have the last word that day. Jesus gave him back to his mother. Restored that relationship. Today, I've not just come to tell you what Jesus did. I'm here to tell you what he will do and can do for you. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We've come today earlier in the service to present our needs before the Lord. But somehow I feel that even as I've been sharing with you this word, that maybe something has stirred in your heart. Maybe you have felt distanced from God. Maybe you're just going through one of those dark nights of the soul when you feel all alone. Today, Jesus wants to come and he wants to rekindle that relationship with you. You may feel that you've done so much and your life is irreparably damaged. There is no life so defiled that Jesus will not touch. Perhaps today, perhaps today, you're facing a relationship that's just dead. He can bring life to relationships. He can restore, he can heal, he can help. So in just a moment, I'm going to pray for you. And I'm going to pray that, that for those today who would like the Lord to do something for you. I'm going to pray that that will happen. Father, I thank you today for your son, Jesus Christ. I thank you today that he has come that we might have life and have it to the full. Though the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, Jesus, you have come that we might have life. I pray today would make a difference in somebody's heart. While our heads are bowed in this moment, if you would say to me, you know, Pastor Mari, I, I really need help from the Lord. I need the Lord's help. I, I feel all alone. I feel distanced. Or I, I feel broken. My heart has been torn apart. Maybe you're going through grief. A grief process. Jesus was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Your heart has been broken because of something that has occurred. Perhaps there's just things that are dead that you need, you need help with today. I'd like for you just to raise your hand where you are. If you, if you have need of prayer today for any of those things, Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.